thank you very much, Olivier, for agreeing to give a build a soul seminar. And you can get started. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's very nice to, to present at the Build a Cell seminar. And so today I will uh, present a few examples of uh, challenges and advantages of uh, resource limitation in cell free system. And in those examples, uh, I would show you cell free systems that are lysate based and using E. coli. So me, I'm um, currently a permanent researcher in France at the Institut Michaelis. And it's a mixed research unit between INRAE, which is um, a national lab, and uh, AgroParisTech, which is part of the University Paris Saclay. So the, oops, the, the lab is in the Paris area. It's in the countryside. It's quite nice, and it's not that far away from Paris, but it's a little bit uh, isolated outside of the city. And we are around in the unit, we are around 340 people, and there is other research labs uh, in the campus. And we, and our lab, and our unit is mainly focused on uh, microbiology, uh, working on health, uh, food uh, research, and uh, more fundamental research like system biology and applied research with synthetic biology. So this is my department. We are a little bit less, and there is um, a lot of research on uh, gut microbiome. It's a very nice uh, place to work, and uh, yes, if you want to visit one day, uh, it's easy to find, and it's connected by train with Paris, so it's nice. So first, I wanted to um, to define what I what I want to what I define as a resource in cell free system. So there's different kind of resources, like in the cell, in living cells, that you can find. So when you work in cell-free, you work with uh, basically the cytoplasms of your of your bacteria. So what we obtain at the end is um, is an extract, the lysate, with uh, different elements. So you have everything to produce proteins. You have the, all the machineries, the ribosome, polymerase. Uh, elongation initiation factors, and all of that, I consider them as resources. So if you express something, you have to use them. And there is obviously also the amino acid, nucleotide, the energy, and also some um, competition for, I would say, space. So if you have, if you, we add the crowding agents to the mix, and this uh, helps us to increase the probability that molecule will find each other in order to look like as much as possible as uh, in vivo composition. And so at the end, you add your DNA. And with all of that, uh, you can have the full transcription and translation process working. So the resources can be at different levels, at the metabolism level, at the transcription level, translation level, and even the space or the elements you need, like the chaperone, to make to fold your proteins. So an, an example that I would show you in this presentation about uh, a challenge of resource limitation in cell free is when you want to maximize your protein production. So to do so, you, you, you will optimize your cell free system and I will show you how, but after a while you will, you will reach a maximum value and then you cannot go much more further or you have to develop other strategies. And this is the main limitation that you also observe in vivo. At some point you have a maximum production. An advantage in the opposite, an example of advantage is also that because there is this uh, competition for resources, you can use cell-free system as a prediction platform when you want to prototype uh, a system, uh, a synthetic circuit. So when you work in vivo, you have a competition for resources. So every time you produce uh, a protein or you express a synthetic circuit, you will take away resources from the cell. You will take away RNA polymerase, ribosomes, amino acid, metabolites, metabolites, NTPs, and all of that, and other metabolites, they will um, affect the growth of the cell. So if you produce too much, uh, you will see a decrease in growth, and this can create mutation, instability in your system. You will not have the correct properties that you wanted to have. And so that all of that, we, we we call it burden, and this affects the cell, the full cell physiology. And so the, the idea of the second example that I would show you is to use the competition you see in cell-free for resources between two circuits to predict uh, the burden that will happen uh, in living cells. So 
the idea was to check if it was uh, at some extent uh, similar competitions that you could observe in cell free and in vivo. So for the first uh, example, so the ones that show you the challenge, uh, the limitation of resources uh, and in cell free, uh, I will show you the example of a work I did in the Follon lab uh, with the, um, at the Evry, at the Genoscope uh, in Evry, and with the collaboration with uh, people of the Institut Pasteur in the lab uh, of Fabrice Agou uh, with the help of Agnès Zetter, who was working in Institut Pasteur. So in this project, we, we wanted to, to use um, an interest property of cell-free that it's an open system. And so you can easily modify the compositions, especially if you have the right equipment. Um, I will show you what I'm talking about. It's uh, mainly in the, the eco machines. And so you can test a lot of different compositions and you can couple that with an active learning approach which is based on a neural network system that you feed with data in order to predict or to optimize, to find the, the best composition to maximize protein production. So to do so, we, need, we needed to do a large exploration of cell-free compositions, and uh, this is what we did. So first, uh, the, the, the first thing we, why we did that first, <laughs> it's because uh, in our um, what when we were doing cell-free system, homemade cell-free systems, we did our own lysets, and this uh, required uh, several steps, uh, like that I described here. So first, you do a cell culture, then you wash. We did uh, our lyset with sonication, but you can also use other physical disruption of the membrane, or you can do chemical disruption. And then we wash, uh, we wash, we centrifuge uh, our um, our product, uh, obtain the, the lysate that we let at 37 degrees during one hour. We centrifuge and finally have what we call the final lysate. So it's not many steps, but because of a small uh, modification from one batch to another, or depending of the person who is using it. Also, depending on the strengths and all of different parameters, we observed that the protein production in each batch was not uh, always the same. So sometimes it was very, when it was the same person with the same machine using the same strain, it was very really close between batches. But when it was someone else, it was sometimes quite different. And so what we assumed is that the Liz composition at the end of the protocol was a little bit or very different from one experimentator to another, and that we could, in fact, um, have a, a better a better mix. So when we have the lysette, we then add a lot of different elements that I put on the figure here. So there is a little a lot of different compounds that we had before we had our synthetic circuits, and this can be easily tuned to maximize the, the production of the of the protein of interest. And so because we considered that the lysette could be a little bit different from one experimentator to another, we also consider that the quantity of each element that we put in the cell free could be different to have a maximal protein production in different lysettes. So what we defined was a combinatorial space to explore. So we took uh, different elements of uh, the cell free. So there is a few that we didn't modify, like the pH buffer. We didn't want it to change that. Uh, we had at the time um, issue to, to uh, manage the crowding, uh, the peg, the crowding uh, element that we had to our mixed. But all the rest, uh, we decided uh, to, to modify it. So we took the maximum concentration as the concentrations that we add here in our initial protocol. And then we vary the concentration in order to make it as very low to very high, so 10 times less. And uh, it was an arbitrary choice. And uh, at the end, uh, we had uh, a, a possibility of 4,194,304 compositions which was a lot to do. So way more than what we could do, uh, in fact, uh, in the lab in a given amount of time. So the choice to, to fix the maximum concentration is, was because we didn't want it to increase the price of the self-free reaction at the time. So we decided to stick there and just to see if it was possible 
to even if we got less of an element compared to what it was at the beginning, we will have a, a, be, a, a better production, potentially better production. So here's a question that can we improve putting production for a given batch? So the idea was to do enough cell culture to have uh, then a lot of lysets that could be the same from the whole first step of the experiment. Uh, then can we provide, can we, after a while, can we train a model to be uh, good enough to predict protein production when whatever the compositions? And can we also find the uh, critical parameters that affect protein production more than the others? So here you have the different elements. Uh, most of them, in fact, they are involved in translation. They are there to optimize translation process. But there is also elements that are there for energy, to, to produce energy over time, like the 3PGA. There is NTPs for transcription. And there is also elements that are involved in stabilization of the mRNA or uh, in, uh, but mostly, in fact, efficiency of the translation. So the first things we did was to, to measure a, a very simple plasmid. So it's a constitutive promoter with an RBS, SFGFP, and a terminator. And so we just uh, do our mix. We put it uh, on, in an incubator of a night, and then we measure the final fluorescence. So in each uh, of our plates, we add um, a reaction with just water because uh, the cell-free reaction uh, fluoresces uh, in, uh, in, in green. And so we always have a background value. So all of these experiments are done in 384 well plates. And so it allows us to do uh, uh, more than 100 reactions in triplicates and have a control in every plate so we can compare plates from one day to another. So in, uh, in the different graphs that I will show to you, when it says we, we put four different colors uh, for the different concentration. So when it's red, it's a maximum concentration of an element. So the, the reference is the initial composition. And then you go to yellow, orange, yellow, green, light green, and dark green. And so we define the, the yield, so the elements that we'll measure as uh, the fluorescence minus the autofluorescence divided by the reference fluorescence minus the autofluorescence of the lysets. So the autofluorescence is always the lysette just, with just water, no plasmid in it. And in all of our experiments, uh, we use the same plasmid, same concentration, and as the lysette, in fact, we extracted a lot of plasmid with a midi prep, a maxi prep, and then we stuck it at uh, minus 80 and just take from that. So we didn't want it to, we wanted to have a stable Lizet collection and a stable plasmid collection. So then how did we explore 4 million different possible uh, compositions? So we didn't measure all of them. We worked with an active learning approach. So to do so, we first um, use the initial training sets in which uh, we add 102 different compositions. Uh, the, the first ones, they were, um, so in those 102, there is uh, uh, half of them, around half of them that are random, randomly picked. And the other ones, they were chosen to be, um, so the maximal value of one of the compounds and the minimal for all of the others. And the opposite, the minimum value for one of the components and the maximum for all the others. So this creates a subset of chosen uh, composition, and the other subset was completely random. Then we fed it to a, a model. So uh, uh, it was neural network-based model. And uh, just for you to know, I'm a mainly trained biologist. So I work with Mathilde Koch in the team who builds the model. And she chose to make also um, all of the uh, of the prediction with uh, 20 time, 25 models. So it was the same model, but uh, running 25 times. And this allowed us to see uh, how the model was able to predict always the same value. So every time we were on, ran it 25 times. And then it gave us instruction. So the instruction where um, both, both the purpose of the instruction was to maximize protein production 
but also explore area of the um, of the combinatorial space that we choose that were that was um, not very well predictable so the idea was both to find the maximal production but also to train the model to be good at prediction whatever the composition and so when we had this information we used the neco acoustic uh, machine in order to to feed uh, to to fill uh, three, 384 well plates and we put the plate at 30 degrees of the night. Then we had GFP produced. We measure it in a plate reader and refeed again the, the model. Uh, and we did that several times. So the, the Echo machine, for people who don't know, it's a liquid handler machine. And it allows you to send the droplets of 2.5 nanoliters in a well. So it's very, very fast uh, to fill a plate with this system. You just need to do some uh, tests before to see that all your compounds uh, are well sent in a well, but when you have it, you just feed it with instruction and then you have your plates uh, ready very quickly. So just for you to know also, it's uh, we, we, we didn't feel, so all of our reactions are in 384 well plates and it's a 10 microliters reactions. So what we did at the time, it's uh, we we use the echo, echo machine to, to fill the plates with all the elements that you see on the top left here. And the lysets, the PEG, the pH buffer, and the plasmid were mixed independently and then uh, uh, distributed in the cell just after the previous mix was done. So after a few iterations, so each uh, of the dots that you see here, it's a mean value of three measurements. So it's one composition done in triplicates. And so one iteration is basically one plate. So you have here uh, 10 uh, plates filled. And you see that over, so on the y-axis, you have the iteration, so a measurement, uh, a plate measured, and then information given to the model. And on the y-axis, you have the yield, so a value minus autofluorescence divided by the reference value minus autofluorescence. So in each experiment, you have uh, three times uh, the lysate with water and three times uh, the lysate with the uh, initial uh, compositions. And so after seven iteration, we managed to increase the yield around 30 times, but uh, we found uh, a maximum that we were not able to, to, um, to go through uh, after the seven iteration. So we even try to, so in, in those measurements, you can see that sometimes you have yields that are very low. And this is when we forced the model to explore uh, especially bad, well, not especially bad, but not very predictable areas, just to be sure that we are not blocked in a local, um, in a local uh, optimal, optimum. But uh, we don't know. Potentially, we could uh, still be in a local uh, maximum, but we have uh, already a 30 time uh, improvement, which seems to be quite good. So we continue to do a few iterations just to be sure, but we never managed to, uh, to get more than the one we had after seven iterations. Uh, we also wanted to know, so if uh, we didn't just wanted to maximize uh, protein production, but be able to know if we were good at predicting um, um, GFP levels uh, in different composition, whatever the composition. And so here we have uh, the prediction accuracy. So um, we compare uh, predicting value to uh, measured value, and we calculate the R square between the two. And uh, so every time we, we train uh, with uh, one fifth, two uh, four fifths of the value our model, and we test it with the uh, remaining one fifth, uh, one fifth uh, compositions. So for the first iteration, we were very bad at predicting anything. The second one was a little better, and then it went down, but then it went just increasing over iteration. And after a while, whatever composition we put in it, we were pretty accurate to uh, to to predict uh, bad or good or medium uh, uh, protein productions. We also wanted to know um, which element uh, was um, 
more impactful, more important in our protein production. And uh, we were surprised to see that a few of them were, in fact, uh, whatever the concentration we put in our mix, it didn't affect uh, protein production that much. So, for example, you can see the tRNA. In fact, you if you put a 10 times less concentrated tRNA, it didn't change uh, protein production that much in our E. coli lysis. So what we assume here is that in the lysis, there is already enough tRNA uh, for the system to work, and or it's over-concentrated, or it's recycled uh, over the reactions. So something you have to know is that all of those reactions are done in batch. So after eight hours, everything stops, uh, whatever you do. So it's just uh, we just put, put the plasmid, and after, yes, eight hours, uh, the, the reaction consumes most of the thing or some um, toxic elements are produced but anyway we have we stop in production and we tried in another experiment uh, later to add fresh media with all the mix and it was possible to restart the reaction a little bit but it was not as good as with a completely fresh media then uh, at the end of the of this uh, iteration this seven iteration we managed to measure uh, 1017 cell free compositions and what we noticed is that some elements um, uh, were uh, at the concentration we used with our lysate uh, were always improving uh, protein production, like uh, Mg glutamate and K glutamate. Here, they were the maximum concentration was the best for amino acid and TPs also. But uh, for a few elements like spermidid and 3PGA, it was better at lower concentrations. For the other ones, so you can see like tRNA, whatever the concentration, you can find it in a very low yield or very high yield. So it doesn't seem to impact uh, the protein projection that much. Then uh, after this big experiment, uh, the purpose of the, the project was to, um, to uh, give a, a protocol for everyone to be able to maximize its own lysate whatever uh, without the need of doing a thousand experiments so from our thousand experiments we took away uh, a subset of 20 compositions that uh, were able to train our uh, machine learning algorithm so well that it was really good at predicting the the maximum protein production so this uh, algorithm is online on the github of the brs and uh, of the jean loup Follon team and so you can find it, and uh, and so you can also find the the set of twenty composition to do. And this was, in fact, well, based on our experiment, the most informative compositions. So, what we did is that we tested different uh, lysets in different conditions. So we tested lysets done from different operators, uh, and also uh, lysets from uh, different strains and lysets in which we add some antibiotics to perturbate transcription or translations. And so in all of those experiments, we measure 102 cell-free compositions. So we choose them to be with our initial sets all around the possible yields. And uh, we train with, so in those 102 compositions, there is a 20 used to train the model, and there is 82 that are used to test the models. So every time we measure GFP, in the 102, we use the 20 to train, and then we compare the prediction of the 82 other composition uh, measured and done with the, with the model. So here the idea is um, to, so first we train, then we, we test our 82 composition. And in um, for us, we use a Neko machine to do the 82 composition just to check that the 20 was good, were good enough to train the model. So it's the same time of experiment. We have the 384 plates. We distribute the different elements with the Neko machine. We grow the, we put them overnight at 30 degrees, and then we measure with the plate reader. And so here you can see um, in the y-axis the predicted yield in the y-axis, the measure yield. And the first one is an experiment done with the same lysate as before. The second plot is done by one of the PhD students of the lab, Paul Soudier, 
and the third one with another PhD of the lab at the time, Angelo Battista. So they, they did the same protocol, same strains using the same machine, but so they are just different operators. And so when you do the training in a one-step training with the, the subset that we defined before, uh, we see a very good uh, link between prediction and uh, and the measurements. And what was funny is that the prediction is a le little less good with the initial lizards and when the two new lizards. But uh, it's, it's very good. It's what we expect it to be. Then we we also yes we also wanted to check uh, in with this little subset of a hundred uh, compound uh, composition if we had different uh, impact of each element, and we see that in fact the the subset the, the set of um, compounds that are not affecting the protein production that much is always the same the tRNA coenzyme A NAD AM, cyclic AMP and folinic acid. Uh, are not affecting our protein production so much in all of our uh, lysate, but uh, some elements are more important in some lysate compared to, uh, to others, like the NTP didn't seem to be as important in the last, last lysate compared to the two others. Then we did another experiment. It was um, using the, um, the original lysate and adding uh, antibiotics. So we use the novo biosins to impact transcription and spectinomycin to impact translation. And uh, also uh, we did, uh, I did another um, LIZET with the strain DH5-alpha, which is not a strain used for production. So in the first one, it's BL21, which is a strain useful for to produce a lot of proteins, but DH5-alpha, it's more for cloning. And so first of all, for the, what you can see on the bottom left is when we put the, the antibiotics that impact transcription, uh, you can see that um, we, we have a, a, a strong diversity of uh, yield. Uh, we are able, in fact, we, we modify the transcription, but we are able to, uh, to, to improve protein production at the end by modifying the composition. So it seems that uh, I will show you later the absolute values. So product production collapse, but by modifying the protein, the cell free composition, you are able to restore a little bit of protein production. When we spectinomycin, when you damage the translation, we see that the, the absolute protein production collapse and you are not able to vary the yield so much. So, which should uh, imply this? Re what implies this results is that when we modify the composition of the lysate, it's mainly the translation that we optimize, and if and if it's damaged by an antibiotic, so you are not able to do so much, and the transcription is not the one that are uh, well, that is um, really impacted by the change in composition. So probably the NTP is important, but the rest it's mainly uh, seems to to improve the translation or the transcription um, is not the limited process in the in the cell free as we did it. And then the GH5 alpha behaves a little bit like the spectinomycin. So we didn't manage to, to, to improve that much uh, protein production with these strains. And we suppose that it's probably a strain that is less, the composition is less, um, uh, as less uh, ribosomes, perhaps, or element of the translation process is less optimized with these strains. And this is a really indirect uh, theory because it's really behave like the spectinomycin. Uh, so here it's the same data, but in which we compare um, the, the measure yield. It's, uh, it's no more prediction here. It's a measure yield with the different compositions. So the 102 composition are always the same in those all of those experiments. So we can compare the GFP production with our original lysets compared to the other lysets. So the first one uh, you see uh, done by Paul Soudier, it's very, very similar to each other's. Even if uh, when you arrive in higher uh, yields, you seem to have a little bit of a plateau, but it's very, very, very similar. 
Uh, the one of uh, Angelo, it's quite different. So in fact, the best composition is not the same at all with this one. But it's a good one, but there, there is some, there is much more noise. So the, the composition affects protein production differently in this laser. Uh, with the one with um, uh, the antibiotics that impact uh, transcription, you also have uh, quite of uh, difference and when you go to spectinomycin or the lysets done with the strain dh 5 alpha you have a very, very different profiles. So in this one, you see that at low yield, you can, you, you kind of have the same behavior, but then you saturate, you are not able to improve uh, the, the composition doesn't, the cell-free composition doesn't affect protein production so much in those new lysets. And so you see a plateau very quickly. So the, the best composition, there is a lot of best composition in those lysets, and this is because uh, the translation is damaged. So here it's a comparison of the absolute value. So we took what we call the general yield. So in fact, we divided all the value by the same value. So it's a, the, it's a, the, the value that we used is the one in which uh, we, you have fluorescence in the original lysets, minus the autofluorescence in the original lysets. It's just a, an idea to give you an idea of the level of fluorescence of the different lysets compared to each other. So you have two other of them that are very close, another one that is a little less. When you put antibiotics, you go very low. And when you have the DH5 alpha, in fact, the fluorescence is not that bad. It's just that you cannot improve it that much. So perhaps, in fact, the translation is not so good in the H5 alpha, but the transcription perhaps is very good. And so you manage to produce enough proteins, but uh, you cannot, um, you cannot uh, uh, improve it. Uh, you don't have so much way to improve it by changing the cell-free compositions. So the first conclusion of this first uh, project was that it's possible to improve an homemade self-reaction to get the most of it without increasing the price of the reaction. So to, we, we will also show that we, by using a neural network approach and a machine learning approach, you can have very, very efficient prediction of your production levels. And you can also, by testing different uh, compositions, uh, find the critical parameters involved in protein production. And so uh, now, nowadays in my lab, there is some elements, the, the, some compounds that we don't add to our mix anymore, like the tRNA, uh, when we do uh, Escherichia coli, uh, Escherichia coli cell-free, and we, we don't see that much of a difference. Uh, also, um, we provide um, a one-step method to maximize protein production for homemade cell-free. So you have to test uh, a composition. Um, you have to test 20 compositions that we provide and then put it in the model to have the best, to try to get the best out of your, of your mix. And eventually what was quite interesting also is to see that the transcription and the translation were not affected in the same way by the cell-free composition. And then we were mainly able to improve translation and not transcription via our composition optimization. Based on that, uh, if you use um, uh, the same the same compounds that you add to your cell freeze, so Mg glutamate, K glutamate, etc., uh, you can uh, improve. You hypothetically can improve whatever bacteria-based cell free, like uh, subsilis or Vibrio nitrogens, uh, with this approach. So we didn't try it, but uh, it could be nice to, to try it at some point. So this was the challenge uh, of uh, the challenging part of the resource limitations that you have in cell free. So you see that depending of the lysets you have, you can have a little bit of difference uh, in, uh, in composition. And so the resource competition could be a little bit different. And so, but so you can still optimize it, but whatever your cell free at some point, you will reach a maximum value of protein production. But this can be seen as also an advantage in the way that potentially um, the competition for resources in vitro could be very similar than the one in vivo. So the difference is that you don't have a growth rate, growth rate uh, modification in vitro. 
but uh, it's still the same resources for a few of them that are um, that are present in both of the on the system. And so uh, we in this project, in the second example I would give to you, we we tested um, how we can compare data obtained in vitro with data obtained in vivo. So this was the cell-free prediction uh, of protein expression cost for growing cells project that I did at the Imperial College in the lab of uh, Tom Ellis. And uh, I will show you the results. So uh, initially, uh, I, I worked with, uh, based on the project of Francesca Seroni, who designed uh, what, uh, oops. Oh, sorry, I see a lot uh, of questions. But perhaps I will come back later for the question. Sorry, I will do that at the end. <laughs> so, for the for the the second the second project, uh, the in which we 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 tried to we managed to use self free system to to predict uh, burden in vivo. Uh, I use the, the capacity monitor of Francesca Sermin. So the capacity monitor it's a cassette of a constitutively expressed promoter uh, expressing GFP incorporated in the genome of E. coli, which she used to, um, to see uh, how, how resources are taken away from the cells when you add the synthetic circuits. And so um, first experiment she did is to compare the activity of the capacity monitor compared to the growth rate. So when you add, um, uh, synthetic circuits and cost a lot. You and you are in a rich media. You will decrease slowly decrease your growth rate the more resource you take away, and this is perfectly correlated with uh, GFP. So the production of GFP by the cell. So not the concentration, but the the GFP per hour produced by the capacity monitor. And so the advantage of this capacity monitor is that you can also use it in cell free, where there is no more growth rate. And this could be an this, this can be an indicator of um, of well, this will be an indicator of resource competition. So the idea is to add the capacity monitor at a given concentration in the lysets, and then add uh, different uh, uh, synthetic circuits and see how uh, the expression of the synthetic circuit uh, modified the GFP production of the capacity monitor. So, for example, on the right, you have um, an experiment in which I uh, I put the capacity monitor in cell free, measure the the GFP production, and then add a different concentration of uh, plasmid with uh, a protein produced. And so, the more the higher the concentration of the new plasmid add to the system, the lower the GFP production. So the first step of the experiment was to choose the compensation of the capacity monitor to put in the license. So to do so, I uh, so just for you to know, in the capacity monitor, I use a, a promoter that is a native promoter of E. coli. It was one of the Anderson collection. And I had a strong RBS followed by the GFP and a terminator. And so I went from... Uh, 10 nanomolar to 100 nanomolar, so very high concentration of final uh, plasmids. And uh, I saw uh, a, a, an increasing GFP production. Then I reached a plateau. And at some point, I still don't have a full explanation of it, but there is a decrease uh, in GFP concentration. So it can be, there is a few hypotheses that we can discuss later if you want, but uh, it was not supposed to happen. We were just supposed to reach a plateau at some point. Uh, I also uh, use um, uh, GFP. I measure the GFP production divided by the DNA concentration. So the idea here is to see how much GFP is produced per molecule of uh, the, per plasmid, let's say, or per amount of DNA. And so at the beginning, you see a very strong, uh, well, strong increase, then a very short plateau. And in fact, after a while, uh, um, your production uh, per molecule of DNA decrease. So it's probably here you saturate uh, your system with, uh, I saturate the system with uh, plasmidic DNA and uh, there is not enough uh, ribosome polymerase to uh, to produce more protein per, uh, per, uh, per plasmid, per molecule of, 
of uh, birth DNA element, birth molecule of DNA, you could say, or birth plasmid. So here I choose to, 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 to fix the DNA concentration as a higher level because uh, I wanted to see this uh, decrease in GFP with other, uh, other plasmids. So the idea here is to arrive near the plateau. So if I put a new plasmid in my system, it will take away resources and so my GFP will decrease. So based on that, so first I have fixed my, uh, my uh, capacity monitor concentration and then I did different experiments. So the first one, was just to put MK8 uh, with a constitutive promoter, under control of a constitutive promoter and different, uh, different uh, RBS. So a weak one and a strong one. So why did I do this experiment first? It's because I wanted to be um, as in vivo. And what I mean by that is that um, when you work, when you read the literature about, about uh, resource allocation and resource competition in bacteria, it's mainly the translation that seems to be the critical process. In fact, the competition at the transcriptional level with um, constitutively expressed promoter and uh, uh, a fluorescent protein seems not to be as important as uh, the competition for ribosomes at the translation level. This makes sense in the way that um, the production of ri ribosomes compared to polymerase is much more important. You have 70 different proteins, you have a very big rRNA, and you also need GTP in every step uh, in which you want to elongate your proteins. So both the production of the machinery costs a lot and the production of your protein costs a lot. So I wanted to be in a I wanted to check that I could be in a situation in which the translation is the main process in which you see a resource competition. So I use this one of the construct with a strong RBS. So you have both have transcription and translation and the other one, very weak RBS. So you mainly have a transcription. So I did this experiment in which I have also my system with a capacity monitor that is fixed. And then I put different concentration of one of the plasmin or the other one. So in orange, you see the result in which I increase the concentration of the plasmid with strong RBS. And the other one is another set of experiments in which I increase the concentration of the plasmid with a weak RBS. And so you can see that between 5 and 20 nanomolar, so the gray area, uh, the transcription doesn't affect uh, the, the capacity monitor so much, but the translation does. And then after a while, you affect both of them. So it means that when you go to higher than 20 nanomolar, you both have a competition at the transcription and translation level, but in the gray area, you are mainly affected by a competition at the translation level. So in all of the other exp experiments, I choose to fix uh, the concentration of the, the competitive, I would say, plasmid at around 20 nanomolar. And so here you can see an experiment in which I use um, um, so so this first feature steps was just to set uh, the 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 two DNA concentration um, of my capacity monitor and the competitive plasmid, and then I uh, designed uh, a set of uh, different plasmids. So it's uh, MK under control of uh, a college of uh, of uh, RBS with different strengths. And what I did is that I, I both did experiments in cell-free and in vivo. So the same plasmid was uh, transformed in vivo and added to my in vitro in cell-free reactions. And what I have here is in the X axis, you have the capacitor monitor activity measure in vivo. And in the Y axis, the capacity monitor measure in vitro. And what you can see here is that you have a, quite a good correlation between the two. There is some outlier, but it was done by pipetting by hand. But it's quite it's quite good. The R square were acceptable, so we conclude from that that um, it was possible to to uh, have an idea of the burden that uh, a circuit will uh, 
will um, create in vivo based on in vitro measurements. Then we did the same experiment in which we uh, changed the gene expressed. So it was not, uh, it was um, um, an operon system in which we had a, a gene of interest plus the MK. And so I had a collection of those uh, plasmids, but here it was always the same RBS. And I redid the same experiment. So I measure in vitro the activity of the capacity monitor and uh, in vivo the activity of the capacity monitor. And here you have also a very nice correlation between the two experiments. So based on that, we were quite happy uh, to say that the fact that there is limitation in resources in both systems was quite similar and all of us to uh, compare uh, resource competition and so to predict burden normally from uh, in vitro system to in vivo system. But to do so, uh, to, to be able to, to connect the two, uh, we designed a, a mathematical model. I used the mathematical model designed by uh, the Gibbard Stan lab at Imperial College, in which they have uh, this very nice um, model uh, in which um, you can uh, use, you can predict the competition for free ribosomes between two circuits. And so in here, you have a, a different steps, you have the initiation steps when the ribosome bind to the mRNA, and this is um, a reversible step. And then you have the initiation of the translation that is irreversible, and then the elongation and production of the proteins. In this model, what you need to have as an information to be able to predict the competition for free ribosome, you need the size of the mRNA, the strengths of the RBS that depend of uh, the different parameters here, and the what we call a gamma value. So the strength of the RBS uh, is possible to predict uh, at the time uh, we we use direct measurements. So I used um, a plasmid with MK of the control of the RBS that, that I wanted to test, and this gave me a, a value of the strength. The mRNA size, I knew it. And the gamma value was the unknown. So the gamma value was something that is quite difficult to predict. It depends of many factors. It can be the, the, the structure of the mRNA. It can be the, the sequence of the mRNA. Uh, but it's mainly the sequence, uh, the condom also usage of the mRNA. Uh, if there is post sequence in, in your mRNA. So this is yet not possible to, to define the, the number of ribosomes that uh, mRNA will need based only on its sequence. So we call that the gamma value. And this gamma value, we measure it with the cell-free reactions. So what we, we did to predict burden from LIZET measurements was first to... Uh, monitor uh, to, 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 to measure uh, the, um, the GFP production in cell Lizet with our capacity monitor. So here, what you can see is, um, so each cross here is a measurement. It's, um, it's, a, a, it's different construct with the same RBS. So it's, it was a B6 sonic system. So it's two RBS. I can explain it later, but basically it's, uh, it, it can be it, in mimic RBS. And uh, you have uh, different uh, proteins that I was productions, producing. So you can see that they have different MRS, mRNA size. And uh, I knew already the RBS strands based on uh, uh, measurements with uh, just MK on the control of this RBS. So this information, the RBS strands I have, the mRNA size I have, and I measure a GFP output from uh, my monitor, my capacity monitor. And this, pay with the model, uh, give me a gamma value. So this is the last unknown uh, element that I need to, measure, to predict burden. So based on this gamma value, now I can use the same model, but in vivo. So I, I use the same model, but now I have all the information. I have gamma value, I have mRNA size, I have RBS strengths. And based on that, I can re-deduce the monitor value uh, and uh, obtain uh, a prediction of uh, 
of my GFP production in cell LIDAR. So just uh, it's perhaps I will detail it more later, but this uh, couple of information. So the information about the gamma value, the mRNA size, and um, the ABS strength is enough with the model to give me the consumption of free ribosomes and so help me to predict the burden, the resource competition in vitro and then in vivo. So I had a value that came outside of this. I was, it was my predicted value and that I compare to the in vivo value. And I was able to have a, a relatively good uh, R squared. I still have some outlier here, but it was uh, very close between in vivo measure data and in vivo predictive data. To challenge this system, I decided to test uh, the Sliceferase biosynthetic pathway. So I, I decided to use the pathway that we had in the lab. And what I did is that it's a very simple pathway in here in which you have two genes. And I just, what I did is just make a collection of these two genes uh, under different promoters, different RBS, sorry. There is no luciferous production at all here. It's just a collection of plasmid with those two, uh, those two genes under different RBSs that I tested in vitro in vivo. And I used the mathematical model to predict the burden in vivo. So, it's easy in here. You just have two mRNA size. I had a few RBS strands, and I obtained a very good prediction between the two. It was 0 0.79. It was acceptable. And uh, it gave me good um, uh, confidence that I could go further more to test other pathways and be able to use in vitro measurements to uh, predict in vivo measurements. And so we, I, I used, uh, with the help of uh, Carlos Bricio and uh, Michaela, um, uh, a collection also of the beta carotene pathway. So in this one, you have four different genes. And here again, we use the collection, uh, they design a collection of pathway with different RBS controlling always the same four genes. So in here, you, you, in the, in, in vitro, um, so in vivo, you had production of beta carotene. Uh, in the first uh, pathway, you didn't have any because I didn't add uh, the different elements uh, necessary to produce the luciferase. But in this one, the, the, the metabolites of the cells help from make production of beta carotene, even if I put nothing more in the media. And so what I did is here, I, I measure the, each genes um, independently on different plasmid in vitro to obtain their gamma value. And then I tested uh, the measurement of, a, composi of a, a, a collection of those different, of, those, of this pathway with different RBSs in vivo. So in vitro, I measure each genes independently in vivo it's uh, the collection, the plasmid with the four uh, different genes. So it will give me a different level of beta carotene, different production of each uh, enzymes intermediate. And so I can compare uh, what would happen based on my prediction and what will really happen in vivo. So when I compare the measure uh, burden in vivo that you, can, you have in the x-axis and the predicted uh, burden based on my in vitro measurement, I had a very, very bad um, correlation. The square was around 0 0.44. So in fact, in, in this example of this pathway, it didn't work. So what we decided to do was to uh, do the same experiment, but in, instead of, um, of, uh, of having a functional, uh, a functional pathway, we had the inactivated pathway. So in fact, it was just a mutation on the first enzyme of the pathway. And so you didn't have production of each intermediate. You don't have consumption of the metabolite of the cell, but you still produce your protein at the same level. So each of the proteins, they are produced the same as before, but it's just that the pathway is not working anymore in vivo. And in this case, the, the, the prediction was pretty good. So in fact, when you, 
you try to, when you use the cell free to produce competition uh, of resources at the translation level, and by that I mean the competition mainly for ribosomes, you manage to have good correlation between in vivo and in vitro uh, in vitro uh, uh, competition, and so you can easily predict. Uh, you can predict. Not easily, but you can predict uh, the burden in vivo based on in vitro data. But if you have a pathway that consume metabolites, you will have a, an extra burden on the cell. And you can see here that in the x axis, the maximum burden that you obtain with the non functional beta carotene pathway is a, a decrease from uh, 1 to 0 0.6. When, when you have a beta carotene production, you go from 1 to 0 0.3. So in fact, you have two different burdens here in the cell happening, a burden due to the production of your protein and a burden to the consumption of metabolites. And so this consumption of metabolites, you don't see it in cell free as it is, as it was designed during this experiment. So what was interesting was that with this system, by comparing in vivo and in vitro measurements, you can separate, you can decouple the expression burden in which you consume ribosome from the metabolic burden in which you consume uh, metabolites. You could also imagine uh, a system in which you add a biosensor of your metabolites, and you could also have the information directly in cell free. But here it was, uh, it was a, another project, and we wanted to see what was predictable and quantifiable, well, possible to quantify. So to conclude on this second example, in here, uh, what we managed to do is that with a standardized base assay, we were able to quantify burden by using the capacity monitor in vitro and compare with uh, uh, in vivo measurements. And we are also able to decouple what we call expression burden from metabolic burden. So the metabolic burden is uh, the expression burden is represented by the consumption for amino acid ribosomes. And the metabolic burden by the metabolites that we had in the, um, in for example here the beta carotene uh, pathway. Uh, so just to, to to conclude with for all this work, so you you saw that there is different uh, uh, use that you can do of cell free. You can try to maximize bioproduction, or you can try to uh, prototype circuits uh, for in vitro in vivo production. And then in both cases, you will have limitation in, uh, in resources in your system, or it will block you to produce more, more than, than a certain level. But it can also be used to, um, to predict both your protein production and the burden that your circuit will create in vivo, which is also very important when you want to move a circuit from in vitro for in vivo, because potentially, a very efficient circuits in vivo will create a lot of in vitro will create then a lot of burden in vivo and this is not what you want you want something that uh, will not affect cell physiology that much or it depends you can uh, you can if you if you realize that your secret will create a lot of impact on the cell physiology you can decide to add some extra control or extra system to control this impact on the cell physiology and so to go further in the direction of uh, prototyping in cell free, we are currently working with uh, Lea Wagner and Mathieu Jules on um, a review that will be we hope will be published in the Computational and Structural Biotechnology, Bi Biotechnology Journal. And uh, what we are interested in now is to push further this idea of prototyping by uh, studying uh, the um, different uh, functions that are kept and lost during cell free production. So during cell, uh, Lizet uh, production. So what we will discuss, and it will come out soon, is um, the impact that your, the production of your Lizet has on protein production and metabolism, but also of adaptation to changing, condition, changing conditions, the maintenance of homeostasis, and the spatial organization of the cell. So we found out that there is a lot of damage, obviously, that is done during cell free, but also a lot of elements that are kept. And there is a lot of strategies to recreate or to, 
to have different property restores uh, uh, that are existing in the literature. So I hope it will interest you. So just to finish, I want to acknowledge my current team, the cyber team, uh, uh, which is um, under the supervision of Mathieu Jules. And uh, I want to thank especially Léa Wagner, Olivier Delumeau, and Stephen McGovern, who help uh, and work with me on self-free systems. Uh, for the, 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 the project on cost prediction, I worked in the Tom Ellis lab, and also with the help of uh, Gibbard Stan. And uh, this work was done with the help of Brooke, uh, Michaela, Carlos, and Francesca. And uh, the first uh, machine learning approach was done uh, in the bio retrosynthèse uh, lab, uh, the Jean Louis lab, with the help of Mathilde Koch, Amir Pandi, uh, Angelo Battista, Paul Soudier, and also uh, at the Institut Pasteur uh, with Agnès Zetor and Fabrice Abi. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. And now I will check all the questions. Thank you very much. There's a lot of questions in chat, if you can go through them. Yes. So uh, the first question is, um, do you, uh, do, uh, do, ah, do I, um, in the gross condition optimization calculation in the first project, do I take into account uh, the gross condition or just the parameter after lysis? Uh, I think of that. So, uh, I just take into account the parameter after lysis. In fact, all of my bacteria are gross in uh, YTP media. So I try to have a very rich media in order to maximize the possibilities to enrich my lysate in ribosome at the end. So it's always um, an exponential uh, bacteria grow in YTP, and I take. Uh, my growing bacteria at the exponential phase before the first centrifugation. So it's just after lysis. The second question is, can you elaborate on the criteria that you use to select the 20 subset combination to train the model? So uh, in, this, uh, in, this, in this part of the project, uh, we, in fact, we what we did is that we tested a lot of combinations. So it was it was mainly the work of Mathilde Koch, <laughs> I have to say. But what she I understood what she did is to um, to try to to test. Uh, uh, she 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 took uh, twenty combinations that give very different uh, GFP levels of measurements, and then she tests the prediction of the model after that. So what I understood is that. Uh, she she had a, a lot of different subsets and she challenged the model to have the best prediction at the end. Could the, the next question is, could the capacity monitor system be used for other extract yeast mammalian, for example? So as it is not because the promoter, the concept of capacity monitor can be, and I think there is work of Francesca Seroni on that. But as it is in my experiment, it was not. It's not possible because it's um, E. coli promoter and uh, RBS uh, specific to bacteria. And uh, even, in fact, even if you want to adapt the capacity monitor to another bacteria, you should change the promoter. So it's some test uh, to do further if you want to do that. Uh, do you think uh, the next question is? Do you think the optimization calculator would work for pure two, or is it specific for well wall cell coli lysates? Uh, huh. I think uh, I think it should be it should be possible for pure two. Uh, in fact, in in the pure system, it could be interesting to enlarge the the combinatorial space, because in my system, the combinatorial space was quite big. But in fact, uh, I had nothing about ribosomes, about the amount of polymerase also that you want to put into. So in fact, in the pure system, we could rework a little bit uh, on the tests that we want to do to have also the concentration in the different uh, protein of the ribosomes in the polymerase. And also, it will depend of the of the buffer that is used. But I, yeah, no, I think it can be 
I didn't try, but um, if you fix the ribosome concentration and the polymerase concentration, you can use the same uh, the same model. Okay, I think this is all the question I see. I don't know if there is uh, more on another discussion or. I think I think these are all the questions in chat. Um, I just want to say I find it really useful, especially the condition optimization for the problem that we've been having, which is reproducibility. We really have a big reproducibility problem in a whole cell isolate, and I'm really excited to see work like that because maybe it will explain why we're dealing with it. But the, the only point I have to make on the reproducibility issue is that here we challenge the reproducibility of the LIZET production. But if, for example, I saw some work on the NIST in which they, they talk also about how you pre people prepare their buffers. And the, for example, by, when you make your MJ glutamate, K glutamate, there is also some variability in the way we, we produce that. So it could be interesting to, so for example, in this work, uh, the, all the compounds were produced the same day by the same person. So even when we change the strains, we add antibiotics on uh, another operators do the experiments, it's only the life that is changed. So we didn't try to, to, to ask someone else to do the preparation of the different compounds. I think it could have been interesting also to, to see that. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to see more of that too. Thank you very much. Um, thanks everyone for the questions and thank you all here again for the talk. And thank have you. a great thank week. Thank you, you too. And Bye. thank you again for the invitation. Bye. Bye.